Highland Park's a unique situation. They've got a brand new school down there. We've seen the, the uh, because of Sandy, and we've been down and met with them. And you know, we're going to continue to try and bring in those opportunities as well, to try and bring students in. But but Andrea's right. We are we are in a competitive situation, and so we're very cognizant of that. And uh, and and I look at you know how do we how do we build revenue? I mean, how do we build the, build the population and increase the population? We need to make, continue to make West Hempstead an attractive place where young families say, where am I going to raise my family? And they look at West Hempstead, and they, they look at the public schools. They look at the diversity of our community. And that, those are some of the strongest assets that we have. So I think that in terms of trying to raise the uh, attendance, that um, by continuing to improve our public schools and offer more programs and more, more uh, uh, diversity um, is, is one of the real keys. I think that a lot of things were said here that were very good. I think that um, programs do have to um, get out there and people do have to know what's going on in the school. Um, I really think that it's twofold. I think not only do you really have to involve teachers in what kind of classes we can offer the students here that would be beneficial to them and to them as far as going to college. What do they really need? What are colleges looking for? Those are the programs that you want to implement also. And you made a very good point about the community. When you come into West Hempstead, you also want to see a community that has a lot to offer. You want to have the best school, but you don't want to see gas stations all over the place. So I think working with our um, commerce, our um, people in the community civic association, also to make West Hempstead be the more businesses coming in, more that would add to the school. I think it's a twofold. I think that you have to promote our school and also promote the community. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Our third question, we'll start with Perry. What is your vision for expanding trade skill programs that benefit kids who want to go into local business and trades and skills trade? We had Bozies, and Bozies were a great program. My son actually went to Bozies, and uh, he graduated there and, and, and got a, a, a one-year degree to go to college for, as a chef. We can develop those type of avenues for our children. Uh, that would be perfect. I would love to see that happen. Uh, right now, he's actually working right here in Rumble Center. That's a plug, so you guys can go. It's Winston's playing Rumble Center. <laughs> We're local guys, so uh, uh, anything that we can do to boost our boost our amount of trade to uh, work with our, with, our, with our kids is what I'm looking to support. I have some um, some experience in that uh, working in the, in the garment district, and I know working with your hands on is it's, it's something that we can do. I know that. Um, we used to have that, and we can build that up the film, but for you. Thank you, Perry. Tony? Okay. Now, for me, I am, I am a hands-on guy, and I do believe that it's important to get more trade programs out. Because you know what? College may not be for everybody, and nowadays, it is very good to learn a trade and at least be skilled with your hand. I believe that we should implement more trade programs and possibly open up some internships. Have some younger kids start working at an earlier age, seeing what kind of trade they may or may not be interested in. See what's involved behind it. They may just pick a trade because they, they think it may be easier than just studying, but they need to see what's involved behind it. They may try and realize that it wasn't for them. So if we can implement programs like that now and make these children aware of it, at least they'll be ready for what's to come afterwards. So in my opinion, as many trade programs as we can get out there, and some internships may be beneficial, but again, I'm, I don't know how much of it is involved because I'm not part of the board and I don't know what our fiscal restraints are, but as, as it comes to me, I'm all for it. Thank you. So like we said, 
the trade is a very important part of my family. My husband is a union electrician. So I understand the value of, of having a skill, but I also understand that being college ready, which is a huge term in our high school, it, it translates to being trade ready as well. If you are college ready, you will be trade ready. <coughs> My husband in the local, uh, local three, he had to go to school for five years, and it wasn't just hands, oh, six years, sorry, correction in the audience, six years. <laughs> it wasn't just hands on training. Um, it was about taking tests, it was about thinking out of the box, it was critical thinking. It was all those things that we are striving to teach our students in the high school. So being college ready is being trade ready. And I know that a good population in our high school takes automotive, takes culinary, partnered through our, our partnership with BOCES. So I think that that's a fantastic avenue that we offer to our children. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea Byers. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I, I love all these ideas. I really do. I love, and, and I do also agree with what Andrea said. And it actually started with what Tony said when he was introducing himself as a as a steam cutter. That he's excelled because of his math skills. And to be in a trade, you can touch these hands and see that I, I don't know anything about it. <laughs> <laughs> I my wife Erin. She does all the work. <laughs> But um, I, I do understand that, the, that having to work in a trade, you have to have computer skills. You have to have math skills. You have to have critical thinking. It's not the way it was, you know, back in the day. Um, that being said, and I want to be clear about this, because when it comes to developing programs, as a board member, we don't develop programs. The administration develops the programs. As board members, we take advice and suggestions, we listen to, we, we, we endorse uh, what, the, what the central administration brings to us in terms of programs. And that they, they develop those programs in conjunction with our teachers and our administrators. They are the professionals. That's who, what we pay them to do. So as a board member, I listen to my professionals. I ask my, my superintendent. I listen to, the, to my teachers union. I listen to all those people, and they give us advice and suggestions about what, what kind of programs we can do. And then we balance those against our budget, and based on what we can afford and what the community really needs. So it's, it's easy to come up with ideas and say, oh, we want this, or we want that, we want this, but it's really, that's not what the board does. The board is a supervisory board that, that, monitor, that works with the superintendent and, and, and the central administration. So, Yes, I'm for uh, 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 programs uh, for, for for the trades, but uh, and, and and I understand that the specific needs of that in terms of of, of being having math and computer skills. But let's be clear, that's not what the, what the Board of Education does. Thank you very much. Thank you, Byers. Carol, I am. I agree with you as far as the board, but I think that also as board members and as educators also working with the community, that sometimes we can um, maybe give suggestions, maybe give programs that would be out there. Um, I know that um, working with um, a special ed population, they do transition skills at a very young age. You know, that's all written on their IEPs. And that maybe we can work with community leaders or community businesses to get some of our children into the businesses a little bit earlier. So working with the teachers and de developing programs, working with outside agencies, um, as, um, I guess it changed names, but it used to be vested, um, and work with those kind of agencies to get programs for our children that need them and that are not college funded. When the state rolled out the uh, Common Core standards, all the teachers grumbled and groaned. And we still, as parents and teachers, grumble and groan when we hear a Common Core. But one of the great things about the Common Core standards is that it, its goal is to get our students um, career, college and career ready from a very young age, from basically kindergarten. So from kindergarten through high school, they're learning the skills to be college and career ready. That includes trade. As going through the years, you have to become a problem solver. You have to become an independent thinker. You have to be able to, 
to look at a math problem and find five different ways to solve a math problem. And I feel that that is setting our students up for success in whatever trade that they want to go into. I also know that, um, that, the, that the school district has taken on new programs such as the coding program and the Stella program. And I think that that will prepare our students to become competitive in the job market in the future. So I do think that we're on the right track in getting our students ready for, um, for trade and for any career, basically. Thank you, Sarah. Our next question, we'll start with Tony. There have been conversations about selling some of the West Hempstead school properties that are not being fully utilized. What do you think should be done? I think for me that's a very difficult question. I have not been around long enough to research what community properties we have rented and what we own and what we're collecting from. So I honestly could not probably answer that question. But I. Honestly, I don't have an answer for that. I'm sorry. This is awesome. There have been conversations about selling some of the West Hempstead school properties that are not being fully utilized. What do you think should be done? That's a, that's a tough question because properties being plural, I'm not really sure exactly what the question means. I do know that we have one property that is currently being rented, and it is being rented by a school, and it is the Marion Delaney property on Eagle Avenue. I, I don't see a need for selling property ever if it's in your possession. So to me, that would be that would be a hard no. Just because I don't see it, uh, I don't see an, a, 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 a need for that. Thank you, um, yes, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm assuming that we're talking about the Eagle Avenue property um, that, uh, that, that we all see. And as Andrea said, that, that property is currently being rented. Um, you know, it's, it's a complicated question. And, you know, as Andrea said, you know, and I think most, most of us feel we, we wouldn't want to sell assets to the community, right? We want to maintain our assets and, and, and be able to leverage those to the benefit of the community. We all own them, right? They are ours. Um, that being said, the Marin Delaney School is 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 a, is a challenge, right? It's uh, it costs a lot to 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 get that school up to code. If we really wanted to do anything with it, it's about it was, I think you know it was part of the bond, and we voted it down, and we went away from it. But it was like I think it was like five million dollars to just to get it up to basic code. It was going to cost us about about six or seven million dollars if we wanted to rent it to someone else. You know, if they wanted to come in just for asbestos. And for to, if we ever wanted to use it as a school again, it was like $10 million. And all of those were estimates. Nobody could really tell you. So that's why, you know, as, as I was part of the bond committee early on, they talked about tearing it down because we could tear it down for $5 million, build build fields, and we could all still use the facility, but we wouldn't have this asset here that was that was costing, that could, could potentially cost us money. It's not costing us money today. It is a net positive for, for the, it pays for itself, let's say that. And we're we're constantly talking about what are we going to do with that property, and 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 who's going to be the next tenant of that property? How can we best leverage that and utilize that asset for the community? Um, but um, as Andrea said, and I, and I would basically agree, you know, you, we, we don't want to start selling properties. We you know that that's that would be something that we would do in a drastic situation. And, and fortunately, you know, after the recession, we're not in that situation today. Uh, that being said, the Eagle Avenue property is still something that we're trying to figure out what we're going to do with long term. But the community said a couple of years ago they didn't want us to tear it down, so we're not tearing it down. It's still going to stay there. We will do with it what we as community choose to do with it. We will listen to you about that. Thank you very much. Thank you, buyers. Carol? I, am, I agree with what a lot of people have said here. I think that it's a discussion that's ongoing with the board. And with the community, um, we also have to take a, take a look. We're talking here about increasing enrollment, increasing our population, and, and our um, educational program. 
But again, when you look down the road and you have to determine whether you have those programs or not, that's a discussion for the board. And I think you would have to do maybe a study to see where our um, demographics is going. So I think it's an ongoing discussion with the board. Thank you, Carol. Sarah. So um, basically, I agree with um, everything that has been said. It's, it's not an easy decision. Um, it should be made with the whole community in mind. Um, people should be able to, avo to voice their opinions and then um, do a, a research and a survey into what would be the best um, the best plan of action fiscally. Um, I think it, it takes a lot of thought and planning, and it shouldn't be just made with, with the board. It should be a community <coughs> decision. I'm a little uh, oh. uh, connected to the school. I went to Mary Lane. I went to uh, Chestnut. And so it's kind of difficult. I don't have any of the information or data that it takes. I do understand what you mean by not going to sell it, but there are some sacrifices and there are some hard decisions that you may have to make. And with the decline of our student population coming in in the next two to three years, I know that that might be something that we have to consider. We may have to sell. And those are some decisions that are hard, um, but if we were able to sell it, it's not an asset, it would be an asset if we did, and we could also use those funds to create more programs for our children. We're not looking to cut anything, but if we were able to sell that property, if that was something that we could look at. Um, I know that when I was on the Strategic Planning Council in 2010 and 11, that we saw the decline, and we saw that this is something that might come about. And so there's two schools in actuality. There's Chestnut, there's, you know, and, these things, are, it's hard to look at. I mean, I went to the school, so it's hard to think about that. But these are tough decisions, and it's something that the board and our community have to make. Thank you, Harry. Our next question will begin with Andrea. And that is, with the current safety issues across our nation on the forefront of our minds, what do you plan to do to keep our children, faculty, and staff safe, particularly from intruders? Um, I hate that question. <laughs> Just because you have to ask that question. I have two young children, one in the elementary school, one in the middle school, and safety is paramount to everybody, and I'm, I'm sad <coughs> that it's a topic of conversation. That being said, West Hempstead has something what is called a smart bond. And that was given to us by New York State to improve our safety and security measures. We are using that to, I'm sorry, yes. So we are using that to, in, to, I'm so sorry, to update our security system. With our bonds, we are creating what they call, and I didn't make this up, this is an actual term, it's called a man trap. And it's like a vestibule. Um, it's like what I would call a vestibule, and it would be one point of access, and before you get to the actual inside of the school building, it would be two points of contact where you would have to show ID. A man trap is one thing. And when we met with Senator Kaminsky, he gave us some ideas as far as reaching out to our senators to ask for upgrades in our cameras. We have cameras all over the buildings, all over our district, but they need to be upgraded. So Mrs. Chris, our superintendent, has sent a letter on our behalf to see about getting some funds so we can update our camera system. We also volunteer to become a pilot program for, and the name escapes me, to tie in our camera systems with the 911 Nassau County operating system. And we volunteer that so it's free of cost for us. And those are all parts of, um, of things that we're doing to keep us safe. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, the smart bond is a big thing, and uh, that is actually in Albany right now. We're waiting to hear approval on that and to get that approved, and so that will be once we get on that, get, get word on that, we'll start uh, rolling that out across the schools. Um, this is a big topic of discussion amongst the board and within the central administration and all of our uh, teachers and everyone. We're all very con con uh, conscious of it. And, you know, look, what are you going to do? I mean, you can't have bulletproof glass everywhere, but we're doing the very best we can. And, and we talk about it all the time. 
in addition to the smart bond and the upgrade of the cameras and all the other things that, that Andrea mentioned, um, there's another piece of this is that Nassau County has now assigned a, a, a one of their Nassau County uh, uh, sheriffs to our school. And, and that person, that gentleman's name, I can't remember, because uh, uh, I have Matt Cal, by the way. Um, but uh, uh, it, it's, he has been assigned to our school, and his, his, his sole responsibility, or his sole mission, is to get to know the physical plant of each one of our buildings and all of our administrators to know any the ins and outs, and, and he has already, those meetings have already begun. So uh, he was in the high school, I think, this week. Um, he's moving into the middle school, and, and they're set, talking, to, talking to us about our plans, our safety plans, our evacuation plans, all of our safety uh, uh, within each one of our uh, school buildings, as well as our central administration. So this is a big topic of discussion within the district. So happy to hear about that man. Man trap. Man trap. Man -trap. <laughs> that's the one problem we have in our school. Yeah. We're surrounded by glass, and the minute you go in, it's all hallways. So I would love to see that here. I did come one night, and um, the guard was there, and I said to myself, anybody could really get in here, and you really need something, and I think that's very, very important. I also think that doing the drills and the lockdowns so the kids aren't afraid or or, you know, can practice that is very important also. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, so um, school safety is a very um, close topic to my heart um, because I, as a teacher in, um, in a special neighborhood, um, I had, to, I had a, an incident with um, a parent who was very violent and I did have to shield my students with my body um, until school safety arrived and escorted the parents um, off the premises. So I, I know the fear of um, somebody trying to harm your students. So I think um, I love the man trap. I love having security cameras in the hallways. I love having security cameras where the uh, members of the office administration can see. Um, I think it's really important to have a school safety officer um, posted at school, not armed, but just to have a presence where somebody can uh, monitor who is walking into the school at every moment. Um, I think it's really, really important that all the students know the school safety plan and have practiced it um, and, not, and, and unfortunately it is kind of a routine but they should know that, that it is to protect them. Um, it, it's, it's really scary to have, to know that somebody wants to um, hurt you and your students. So uh, any plan, any new um, innovations, I think would be welcome. Thank you. So this is a very sensitive time here in our, our life here. Um, that we have to speak about this, and I like the man trap, I like cameras. Um, one of the things I think is really important is for us to get our community involved, just like Tony said, today is a great outpouring of our, of our families, our, our neighbors here. If we had some kind of volunteer uh, men's group, or any kind of deterrent, and getting our, our, our families um, to participate in after school activities, as a volunteer basis, and any way that we can actually help out and show a presence that our community's together, that I think that's a, that'll really be a great deterrent. I know that when I was at another school, uh, they had a, fam a, a father's uh, group that actually paroled the whole school system. I mean, it was great. Uh, and, and that wasn't any extra cost because it was volunteer. I'm for volunteer, tearing up for Man trap. I'm also for the um, more cameras in the sheriff. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I guess there's only so much that you can repeat every answer. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, listen, yeah. <laughs> Everything that has to be set and put forth so far with the school and their safety 
They're on top of it. They're, they're trying to do what they can with the ability they have. Like Byers had said, you know, we are assigned an officer, the man trap, you know, the only other thing that we can't stress more is repetition. The more time we do the drills, the more these kids are aware of certain drills, the more the students will learn and know what they have to do, God forbid, ever, if a scenario was to ever happen. And the children need to, you know, be made aware. It's sad that we have to do this to our children and expose them to this, but unless they're exposed and made aware of it, they won't know what to do when it really does happen. And as, more, as much as we can be involved in it, kind of like what Perry said, perhaps get some parents together and patrol or walk around, walk around the community. It doesn't even have to just be the school because it doesn't just happen here. It could happen to your child walking home. They just, people need to be out and need to help and help look after these kids. These kids are what our future is all about. So that's just my thought. We'll start with buyers. Regarding school taxes, some people feel taxes should be cut. What is your definition of fiscal responsibility? Great question. <laughs> Timely question. Um, fiscal responsibility, it's about, um, as I mentioned, as a school board member, our job is to supervise the, the board, the, board uh, the, the, the school administration, the, su the uh, superintendent, and the assistant superintendent. Another role is, is the oversee uh, and approval of the actual budget. So we take that very, very, take that very, very uh, seriously. Um, you know, it's, it's been said, I've, I've heard people saying, seen it posted, you know, we're going to cut $15,000 from the school budget, we're going to give you $5,000 back on your taxes. Here, here as, as someone that's been involved in the district for a long time and been involved in budget workshops and down on the board, I can tell you there are only two ways to do that. You're going to fire teachers and cut programs and you're going to cut buses. That is the only way you're going to do that. Our health care costs alone went up 10% this year. We've done a very good job and we're working with all of our teachers and all of our, all of our professionals to manage our budget very, very closely. And as uh, Andrea said, you know, our, our auditor, you know, we, 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 they, they tell us, you know, we do a tremendous job. And as a member of the board and as people that are responsible for how we are spending the community's uh, 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 money, look, $61 million is a lot of money. Hey, look, I would love to get $5,000 back. You know, as they say in Hollywood, you can never be too rich or too skinny, and I'm neither one of those. So I would love $5,000, but, but what I'm not willing to do is take $5,000 and destroy our public schools. Thank you. very, very hard to cut taxes. If, um, if we could, I would, I would love my taxes cut, especially from New York State. But it's very hard to do. But you want to make sure that the money is going into the right place. You want to make sure that the, um, the budget is geared to the programs and to the children first, um, before, you, before anything else. You want to be able, as a, um, as a board, to manage the money, to make recommendations to the superintendent, to make recommendations to the principals. Maybe to sit down with them to see what the needs are. See what the needs are for the teachers, what programs they need first. And that's why I think the direction that I would go into. Okay, so Sarah? Okay. Um, I agree with Carol. I think that um, as a board member, before we vote on any programs that um, we're presented, we have to do our due diligence in research any programs that are um, brought to the table, we have to make sure that um, we have to research the student outcomes of all the programs, make sure they're cost effective, um, that when we hire people that we really look into um, who we're hiring, um, their track record, their effectiveness. Um, it, we really have to do a lot of research into what we're investing. Because basically we're investing in our children we want to make sure that we do make the right investment and we spend our money wisely and not just, you know, waste it. Not that we're wasting There's two things that we're short of. That's death and taxes. And I'm like a uh, buyer, uh, buyer, so uh, 
If I was going to receive $5,000, I'd vote 10 times. So. <laughs> but um, um, what I think is that's really important is um, that we're not looking to cut any taxes. I'm not looking to cut any teacher's salary. I'm not looking to do that. Well, I think that if we were able to take into consideration that we have property that's not an asset and do something with it, we can actually put that into our program and, and, and build our programs. Um, and we have, there's a couple of things that we can do, uh, but I'm, I'm not uh, educated on the, the, the data enough to be able to say A, B, C, and D, but there are always some things that we can do, and I'm looking forward to working on the board to find out. I know lowering taxes is a big topic and everybody would love to have their taxes lowered and you know get away with this and that. But from every community board meeting I've attended and the PTA meeting and every meeting out there, you sit there and you listen to the school board speaking with the superintendent, talking about the programs that are out there and what they suggest. And you listen to the teachers and the, the, the excellent job that they've done teaching all of our students. Honestly, as a well-rounded student, you need to know every aspect and every program out there, as well as sports, as well as academics, as well as home ec. So to cut a program just to lower property tax, I think is harmful to our children, and it is not something that I would honestly look forward to. In order to make some kind of educated decision, it has to be advised more from the superintendent sitting down with the school board and providing whatever data and facts you need to make that well-educated decision. Thank you. Andrea? So the question was um, that ta people would like taxes to be cut, but what, are defi what is my definition of fiscal responsibility? Fiscal responsibility is probably one of our main jobs as a board member. I don't think cutting taxes and being fiscally responsible go hand in hand. I think being fiscally responsible is making sure that our students have the programs that they need, the teachers have the tools that they need, all doing it in a fiscally responsible way. Meaning, we don't spend willy-nilly, but we know what our, to use Ms. Sesame's word, to, use, to know what our investment is. And our investment, fiscally, is our students. We have to make sure that they are taken care of, number one, and doing it in a fiscally responsible way. We have educators and administrators that advise us every step of the way. So there is no frivolous spending. It is done in a way with keeping education paramount while doing it in a conservative way. And we do that. Start with Carol. How do you feel about students opting out of assessment testing? <laughs> <laughs> this is going to be a very tough one because I know that um, I, I know as far as teachers in, in public schools, um, kind of want the kids to opt out. From what I heard, um, from what I heard, from what I heard, that teachers. In my school, and what I feel as an educator and a teacher, I really feel that kids should not opt out of tests. I think it's a great opportunity for the kids to practice their skills, and especially the way that um, tests are coming down from New York State, and it's more critical thinking um, questions than regular questions that have been asked on the test. The um, Regents tests are more critical thinking when they're asking them to write essays. And what better way than to have the children start at an early age, testing starts at third and third grade. So what's a better way than to have these children, they start now, so what better way is there than to have these children practice and you can take the test afterward and use it as a learning experience. So um, I think, first of all, it depends on, on the assessment that the student has to take. I think you have to decide what the, um, the test is assessing. Are they assessing skills that they've learned from whatever grade they're in? 
say from first to fourth grade, how are they assessing it? Are they assessing it fairly? Are they asking questions that really are measuring their skills? And if, it's, if they're not measuring their skills and if they're not appropriately um, assessing exactly what they have learned and what we need them to learn, then I think it's up to the parents to decide if they want the child to opt out. It's the parents' right. Every parent knows their child. Every parent has that decision for their child <coughs> to opt out or not. It's, it's your child's well-being. I, I think that it's up to the schools to find an appropriate assessment that will measure what your students have learned. It, it's important for the schools to know how much of all the students have learned. We need to have an, a measure of assessment to know um, if our instruction is effective or not. And if it's not effective, then we need to, um, to look at our curriculum planning and to plan lessons that do meet student needs. Assessment is important, but it has to be appropriate. It has to be fair and show, show that the schools are effective. Thank you. I'm not for opting out, but that's me. Uh, I believe it's up to the parent, but opting out, uh, if we teach to our children, and, and the way that we can figure out where they stand is through testing, unfortunately, um, we'll know what is needed. Uh, I know that um, the third and fourth grade are ahead. Um, you notice that we have more high-risk students at that time period. And, and if we are able to see that, catch that, and start working with our children at that point, then that will help them to get uh, college ready. What happens is when they graduate high school, they're taking 13th grade when they enter into college. So I don't think we should shy away from testing. I think that's something that, that we need to do. funny because this is an ongoing topic also in my house as well. I'm for it. I have one child who I did make take it because to him, he doesn't mind taking tests. He doesn't, he, he wants to see where he's at. But I have a daughter who's a little uncomfortable and feels the stress of possibly being ranked or the repercussions of just not doing well because she's timed or doesn't have the time to finish the test. I think it is a great program to develop standards and have kids try to achieve them, but I do think it needs to be tweaked. The assessments they do of the children and the way they rank the teachers needs to be corrected. The basis, I think, is great. Once they fix it and, I think, tweak it, I don't think anybody will be opting out anymore. But, you know, that's to see in the near future, hopefully. Thank you. So opting out is a very um, touchy subject. So I'm going to speak to it as far as a parent first. Um, I opt both of my children out of the state test. <laughs> not because they're afraid, they don't have test anxiety. My middle school child is on the high honor roll in the National Junior Honor Society. It's not because I'm afraid of the test, it's because I don't believe in the test. <laughs> I can't morally subject my children to a test that ties their teacher's evaluations to it. I just, I just can't do it, and I haven't done it, and I, and I won't do it. When they revamp this, like, like Tony said, and they take teacher evaluation out of it, I will revisit it. But I know that my, my student, and I know evaluations are important, but my children's teachers are assessing them all the time. My, my children's teachers are the best measure for how they're doing. I don't need to see the test. Well, like Andrea, I guess, and I mentioned we're a mixed family, I guess we're a mixed family with this as well. I sort of think of um, these opting out and these, these tests as sort of being aligned with Common Core. You know, it's controversial. Everyone has an opinion on it. 
Um, I, look, I, I'm, I'm not a professional educator. I, I, I really listen to the advice of professional educators. My mother was a high school educator. I had teachers in my life that impacted me. They know what they're doing. And, you know, I, I understand, you know, the controversy around it. That being said, look, I'm in business. We're measured every day. You know, we have to be measured. We need some way to measure how our children are doing, how our teachers are doing, how our students are doing, our schools are doing, et cetera, et cetera. But we need to, you know, to continue to refine that. And I look at Common Core and these tests as sort of, as I refer to it, the, the mix of art and science of teaching. It's not like a, a, a silver bullet for it. And we'll continue to refine it and try to find, and continue to get better at it over time. So, um, you know, I, I don't have a, a strong opinion on it of right or wrong. I think it's an individual choice, and uh, I respect anybody's choice to choose what they do. And our household will do what Aaron says. <laughs> What are you excited about that has happened within the West Hempstead schools in the last two years? Okay, so I'm really excited about the, the STELLA program um, and the coding program. I think I think that's awesome. I think um, having enrichment in the arts and sciences, literacy, and library skills is great. Kids love programs. They learn more through hands-on activities. They learn more through doing, not just by listening. And the more you can engage students and have them um, broaden their horizons and their creativity, I think that that's a successful program. Um, coding now is where it's at. Um, I wish I knew how to code. I wish I had coding when I was young. I wish I had had a computer when I was young. But um, I think that giving giving our students those skills is going to make them really marketable in the future. And it's just going to give them an edge over so many other students that don't have these amazing programs. Harry? I'm really happy about West Hempstead, period. We still have a school district. We still have schools. We always know how budget is. I love the fact that we have a pond. I love the fact that we have a football field that's being done over. I love the fact that we have a tractor. These are all things that, that some parents look to when they want to come to our school district. I just ha I love what's happening right now, and I just want to piggyback off that and make it, make it a little bit better. That's it. I love it. Uh, there's a lot of great things that are happening, and I just think you get a little bit better. I'm waiting for that. Thank you very much, Perry. Tony? Can you repeat that one more time? I certainly can. Can you repeat the question? What are you excited about that has happened within the West Hempstead schools in the last two years? The bond is definitely a big part of that. To see now the schools being updated and new rules put on, Science lab getting ready to be put in. Programs being installed as far as, like Sarah said, the coding program and there's a few others. It, these are some big changes in our community. But the structuring also is another big topic that is going to take effect. And that, honestly, is probably one of the most important and, honestly, I want to say one of the best things that may have happened to some of these students. I think now students, instead of being sectioned off by neighborhoods and not being separated by classes, is definitely a much better opportunity for the children to learn and a better teaching environment. I've coached probably, I can't even tell you how many kids in this community within the 11 years that I've been here, and so many children on a team say, how come he's in the same grade as me and I've never seen him? It's because they've been in two different schools. So now that they will be in one school, They'll get to hang out with each other more. The social involvement will be better. The teachers will be able to sit there and talk with other teachers and discuss each student daily instead of getting together maybe once a week discussing this, children, this child's progress. So for me, those are the most things that have impressed me within the last two years. Thank you.
this is a much better question than this safety <laughs> question. I love this question because there's there's actually so much that I'm excited about. I've been on the school board now for three years, and I can say in three years, I've seen leaps and bounds in the progress that we've made as a district, and I'm really, really proud to be part of that. So what are some of the things I'm excited about? Definitely the bond it is a huge boon for our community. Our fields are being revamped. Our science labs are being redone. We're, we're, we're moving forward in a positive direction. Our restructuring, in my opinion, is a great thing for our district. It's bringing our kids together. It's equalizing our class sizes. It's equalizing our special education services. Those are all things that are really important to a cohesive community. I think our academic achievement is probably the thing I'm most proud of, which is not part of the question, but I'm still excited about it. Our ELA, our ELA scores jumped 10% in one year. that we're on the right track and nothing will. 10% in one year is huge. I'm really excited about that and it will only go up from there and I'm certain of that. So it's a great time to be involved in what comes next. Myers. Thank you. Um, like Andrea, there, there's so many things that I'm proud of with what we're doing in this district and excited about. I had to put my glasses on so I could look at some of my notes. I, the bond, of course, is one, and, and, I, and you know we talked about community involvement, we talked about spirit, and, and, and when we were looking at the bond, one of the things that we were talking about is the fact that you know our kids didn't seem to have much pride in our school anymore. But when you walked around, there wasn't a lot to be proud of. Well, soon, there, that, now there's a lot to be proud of. We're going to have brand new science labs next year, or we'll be starting those. You know, there's so much to be excited about that the kids are going to pick up on that, but also academically. You know, uh, she, uh, Andrea mentioned the ELA scores. The 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 uh, it was the, the, the um, uh, um, uh, algebra two went up like forty one percent in one year. One year, forty one percent. We all of this and what we're doing and adding programs. We're adding programs for next year. Uh, uh, mixed media, uh, international studies, and uh, what uh, what are they? Well. World of Technology, Model UN, Mixed Media. These are all new, new programs that are coming into the high school next year. Our professional development for our teachers. They're, they're, our teachers are being recognized within their profession in terms of how, what a great job they're doing. I'm very proud of our teachers. Um, and we're doing all of this. Thank you very much. And we're next to the fiscal responsibility. So I'm very excited about that. And, uh, and I, I really hope that we can continue continue on this track. I can keep going because there's a lot more that I can say. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I love hearing about the programs that are going to be implemented next year. I was very happy when I did hear about the restructuring. I agree with Tony that um, having the kids in the buildings that, that they're going to be in is a plus for the educational process. It's also a plus for the teachers and the development of the programs that they can also implement and talking to each teacher, talking about each student instead of going from building to building to building to me is a real plus. Now we will begin our closing statements. And as I as mentioned in the beginning, we're going to start on this side with Andrea and continue down the road. You'll have a um, three minutes. Thank you. It's a beautiful thing to be gifted with the care and education of our younger generation. It's a big, in, big responsibility to ensure that we get it right and to make corrections and admissions when we don't. It is our responsibility to encourage our kids to become lifelong learners, to show them that the sky is the limit and that every little person is a scientist a doctor, an environmentalist, or an educator. And that quest for knowledge is what sets those minds free. Our children hold the keys to everything that we hold dear. Love, family, community, prosperity, imagination. It's our job to foster in them a sense of belonging and a safe space where they can engage in their curiosity, where they can reach their fullest potential, whatever that may be. How do we accomplish such a task? It starts at home and it broadens into our schools and our community. Our schools are the cornerstone foundation where dreams are built and fulfilled, where play and imagination and learning and growing happen. Without a strong school system, we as parents and residents 
cannot provide for our greatest asset, which is our children. I believe that here in West Hempstead, we have that foundation. In my time volunteering, I have seen children of this town grow and reach goals and milestones. I've seen educators nurture their students, and I've witnessed kids being extraordinary. I've seen classmates raise each other up and celebrate the accomplishments and differences of their peers. They are able to do so because the people of West Hempstead value education and what it does for the kids and the community at large. It's been a privilege to watch. I believe in our school system and what we've accomplished so far. I am proud of the changes and the forward-thinking direction that the district is headed in. Even among differing opinions, the heart of the discussion is always centered on what's best for the children we are tasked to care for. And as a community, while it is a great responsibility caring for these generations, we have always managed the business side of education with prudence, remaining aware of the ramifications of our decisions. The strength of our town has a great deal to do with how strong our schools are and what opportunities we can provide. We need to come together as a community to ensure West Hempstead stays strong. I know that we are capable of great things in West Hempstead, and I believe staying on our course will bring our students even more success and residents to pride in our town. Thank you very, very much. I know you've all heard a lot here tonight, and it's a lot to take in. I'd like to thank you all for giving us all the opportunity to get to know each one of us and listen to us. This has been, for me, a wonderful learning experience and still so much to learn. I would be honored to help further this progress for our children, which happen to be the most important factor here tonight. I would like to help continue the fight to give them a better education and whatever they may need to help them achieve their goals. As a coach, I've sat and worked with a lot of the children and been involved in this community for many years. And I have no doubt in my mind that if these children are given, are given, excuse me, the right tools and opportunities and programs, there is no doubt in my mind that they cannot achieve whatever it is that they set out for. It's just, it, it all basically comes down to us being involved. And the more we do get involved with these children and we do try to help them in any way we can, they will prosper and will do the best, in my eyes, as well as they can. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tony. Well, I'd like to thank uh, West Simpson community coming out tonight. This is great to see as many people here tonight. I also want to thank Andrea for your, for your service. You're volunteering here on the board and, and uh, doing a great work. I think that um, what I would love to be able to do is to serve on the board and, and to offer my, my experiences as a, not only a, a student here, but a, a business owner here, <coughs> someone who's been an assistant daycare provider, um, working with children, serving the children behind the scenes and in the scenes here. Uh, also, uh, as a football coach for Broncos, uh, I, 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 and a, a business owner as a salesperson here, I, I just love the fact that I think I'd be able to do something for our families here. Um, I know that being a team player is very, very important. Being a community participant is very, very important. Um, being able to listen and to learn from people who are already doing this and, and to the, to listening to the community is very, very important. Uh, I, I'm looking to do all those things and continue on the progress that we have. I just thank you for this opportunity. I'm hoping that you guys will come out and vote for me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Perry. Sarah? So th thank you, everybody, for, for coming. Thank you for the opportunity that you gave us to speak and share our ideas. Um, our children, like I said before, are our number one investment. Um, we have fiscal responsibility. But we also have our number one responsibility is raising our children and give, providing them with the best education that we can. I believe that West Hempstead can provide that for all children in the community. Um, it takes a village to raise a child. I feel that we are the village, we are raising our children, and the board has a responsibility to help everybody raise our children, raise them strong, raise them healthy, we raise them wise to make good, wise decisions as adults. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Sarah. Carol? I would like to thank everybody, especially the board members, the current board members, who have done a wonderful job. Um, living in the community for 28 years and um, being part of this community, I think it's wonderful. And for teaching for 36 years, I'm hoping that I can bring, if I am elected, that I can bring um, my years of experience um, working with staff members, developing programs, because I only want the best for our children in this community. Fires. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you, Sarah, for moderating the meeting. Thank you, PTA, for coming in together. Thank you, members of the community, for coming out. Um, I'll say this is it's great seeing everybody. And you know, after next Tuesday, you know, I hope that everyone on this dais and everybody in this community that's in this room will continue to come and stay involved in our public schools. That is and, and, and call me naive, but I actually think it's wonderful that we have people that want to serve on the board, people that are running for the board. There have been years that I've been here that you have folks in the city. And, you know, and it's great that we have members of our community that want to be here. Here's the key. We need people that want to build and support our public schools, not tear down our public schools. You know, as, there is nothing more important in terms of measuring the quality of our community and ensuring the quality of our home values than of the quality of our public schools. You want to destroy your home values? Cut and kill your public schools. So let me do this for selfish reasons. I do it because, yes, I believe in public service. I do it for my children. I do it for all of our children. It's a lot of work, I'll tell you. You know, we were here at 1130 last night. I mean, we put in a lot of hours. And to see everybody here, and, and, I, and I hope that everyone will be informed and realize how much effort this community and the board and our administration, our teachers and our professionals put into delivering a quality public education to our community. And I would like to think that as time goes by, that we're not going to lose our best and our brightest to Chaminade and Kellenberg and Holy Trinity and Hank. That they're going to want to come here. Because I can tell you my experience when I was growing up. If you were at any other high school than the high school that I was going to, it was your misfortune. Because we believed, as members, of, as members of that high school class, we were in the best place we could be. And we didn't want to be anywhere else. We excelled in everything. Academics, athletics, theater, arts, everything. It was the hub of our community. This, this high school and our public schools need to be the heart and the soul of our community. We're doing a lot of great stuff in our community. And we've got a lot of great stuff going on in our, in our district. We're fiscally responsible. We're adding programs. Academics are growing. We're, we've, we've got a new high school principal that we just introduced last week. He was a, on a national championship lacrosse team at, uh, at uh, 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 Johns Hopkins University. So we can expect championship lacrosse coming up. <laughs> we're, we're doing all the right things, folks. We just got to keep it going. We don't want to quit now. We want to keep it going. Thank you very much. to thank the West, the West Hempstead PTAs for asking Nassau Region PTA to conduct this forum for you. Um, I'd also like to especially thank Sonia Dixon for assisting in being our timekeeper for the evening. And Sonia and I would like to thank the candidates tonight for participating and the audience. Oh, go ahead. And the audience for asking questions. And I have to say, I've been doing this for about 12 years now. And I tonight I received 176 index cards. So it's very, very clear to me that you are very passionate about your school district. Congratulations. Take that passion and that energy 
and make sure you go out to vote on May Tuesday, May 15th, and vote for your candidates. Thank you.